Brandon, you are a busy man. How do you do everything that you do and still get away with it? Man, I'm drinking a Celsius and eating a banana right now. <laughs> I think that's the answer. Oh, my God. Your creativity is just, it's its always been so inspiring because its it's like you don't have walls in front of you. Oh, man, I think I have walls. I just sort of like, you know, the, uh, the, what's the Kool-Aid man. I just like run through them, you know? <laughs> and so when, when you, when you're able to do that though, I mean, you're giving yourself permission to step out there and be yourself. So many creative people, you know, want to follow this format or go this direction and stuff like that. But I mean, what, what's great about you is that you move through things that, that it just it inspires other creative people. Yeah. And you know, I was inspired by other creative people, you know, so I'm just following in the footsteps of, uh, the folks who've inspired me. So how how were you able to come up with the concept and idea for Blink 182's We Are Coming? Because I dude, I laughed so hard and had <laughs> to spread that everywhere I could go because it was so funny. Thank you. Um when I was tasked with making that, Travis Barker was like, you know, this is, you know, you were putting out a new song, Tom's on the album, like let's let's do something really exciting. And I've been a fan of Blink 182 since Dude Ranch. I played in a essentially a Blink-182 cover band from the sixth to eighth grade. And I've just been a huge, huge fan. And I just, I wanted something that tapped into the essence of Blink-182, which is hilarious and also just executed masterfully. Um, they've always been one of my favorite bands and one of the funniest bands. Um, and I actually stumbled upon an old Bud Light commercial that inspired that and I thought what if I flip this on its head um, I'm so glad you dug it well it's because I mean I got into radio all those chapters ago four decades ago because of a concert commercial so when I so maybe that just woke up the child inside of me and said oh my god the, you know a Blue Oyster Cult commercial is why this is all happening for me and to, so to see this it's like oh this is so cool Oh, that's awesome I also did think about it in the sense of audio like I thought it was something that you could play on the radio and promote without the visual and it would still be a funny bit you would hopefully get the essence of it now being uh, with with uh, travis and, and and tom i've been with both of them i love how down to earth these two guys are they they give you that opportunity to really kind of dig into their story because they've got something to share yeah no it was incredible like again travis was the the ring leader of this thing like in the sense of like you know, I was dealing with directly with him. He was like, you know, send me the scripts. I'll distribute it to the band. Like he was very much uh, had his finger on the pulse, very down to earth. It wasn't like, you know, I went through like 20 different, you know, managers and labels and Live Nation. They were all involved, but Travis was very involved. And and same with Mark and Tom. Now, let's let's talk about I'm Totally Fine. They, 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 there's such a twist in this that makes me think every time I have a conversation with anybody, I want to know if, if, if I'm having a Jennifer moment. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all having Jennifer moments, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's come up with this. Where, where the heck were you when this idea fell into your lap? I was in uh, my one-bedroom apartment with my <laughs> fiancé and I in 2020, sort of uh, dealing with the uncertainty, you know, and trying to make sense of it all. And uh, I tend to try to, uh, you know, unfortunately anxiety induced, try to control a lot of situations and outcomes. And that one, none of us can control in any second, you know, we were learning moment by moment. And the moment I sort of uh, surrendered myself to that, I was able to be a little less uh, anxiety ridden and, and I could chill out and sort of try to make the best of a bad situation. And, and that feeling is what uh, sparked. I'm totally fine. I thought, how do we explore the death of 2020 the uh, the loss of control, and I thought, you know, what better way than with uh, an extraterrestrial? Yeah, and you know what's really interesting about this, Brandon, is the fact that you know anymore all we hear about are AIs, and I'm so glad that you that you put extraterrestrials back in, in on our tongues because it gives us that opportunity to. I mean, this is what we had before AIs. Yes, mm -hmm, absolutely, and I don't know which is going to come first, the aliens <laughs> or the AIs. I think they're both on their way. And and I wonder who would win in a fight. I don't know. <laughs> You're right about that. <laughs> so when, when, when a concept like this comes to life and you're, you're sitting there tapping away onto that computer screen, are you laughing? Are you giggling? Are you listening to music? What, what happens in your personal life? Because I love writing myself and I know the quirky things that I do. Yeah. I like listening to really, really heavy metal and just walking around my neighborhood. That is like my brainstorm office. 
uh, walking around Sherman Oaks, California, listening to really, really loud metal and sort of just finding a rhythm and letting ideas flow. And then, you know, this project, when I had the concept, I knew that um, I wanted to bring on the right writer for this project. And I brought on Alicia Keetry, who I met uh, actually in film school waiting tables back in Chicago. And she's a brilliant writer. She's a writer on American Dad. She has other great uh, projects in development, but her sense of absurdity uh, paired with also her deep understanding of the human condition. I just thought she was the perfect person. And then we were so lucky to attach Kyle Newichek as our producer. And Kyle comes from, he's one of the creators of the Workaholics. He played Carl yeah. in Workaholics. He directed that show. He now directs what we do in the shadows. So that fun process was the three of us on Zoom laughing crying, getting really serious, getting really silly, and really exploring this whole project. It was an absolute blast. I've been to Sherman Oaks, and I've written in Sherman Oaks, and, and what really always inspired me about Sherman Oaks was how big the streets are, how cracked the sidewalks are, how old the homes are, but yet those brand new cars drive by. And, and it's like, oh my God, I love being in, in, in these moments. Yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, born and bred Chicago boy. And when I moved to LA, I really found that Sherman Oaks sort of gave me uh, more Midwest vibes than the rest of LA. And I absolutely, I love Sherman Oaks. My friends call me the mayor of Sherman Oaks. It's my favorite <laughs> part of town. I love walking up and down Ventura Boulevard, yep. uh, listening to music, taking it in. Um, it's my favorite. There's that great Hain music video. I don't know if you've seen it where they just walk from Beverly Glen to Van Nuys Boulevard on Ventura. It's one shot of them just walking and dancing. It's it's like one of my favorite music videos. Well, it's a, it, first of all, that whole entire area, there's something very peaceful about it. And is it because of the that it used to be all of these just open fields of peaches and stuff like that? Because I, I'm trying to remember why I even, I mean, because I started doing research on Sherman Oaks and it's like there's an energy there that you can't explain, but you want to be there. The Valley's just great. I think Paul Thomas Anderson does a great job of capturing it all the time in many different ways. And most recently in licorice pizza, there's just a certain history and nostalgia there in Americana. It's, it's so great. Well, even the earthquake gave it a good, you know, that, that's a chapter of its own. My, my very good friends were out there during that earthquake and my God, I mean, they, they survived it, but it's still, they, they said they've never felt anything like it. Yeah, I can't imagine. I live walking distance from that Galleria. And, you know, part of the reason my friends and I, you know, I went to film school with a couple of friends that I, I've known since like the fifth grade. We, we made videos together. We played in bands and then we went to film school. Then we moved to L.A. and we really based the valley on movies. We're like Encino Man, Terminator, Chopping Mall, all these things take place in the valley. That, that's that got to be where we should go. <laughs> so when you put a, a comedy movie together in 2022, what, what's keeping you into the discipline of keeping, a, keeping it a movie and not going the route of, I'm going to do a 19-chapter binge watch here? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I wanted to actually get something made. You know, mm. I've had things in development for years and years and years, and they either happen eventually or they don't. And um, going into 2020, I had a, a, a different feature set up, a, a big, silly action comedy, which I was really excited about. And the pandemic also uh, took that away. And I knew I wanted to actually make something. And when this very personal emotion hit me and I, and I wanted to tell that story, I thought, how can I tell it in a condensed way? Um, and both both on a, a production way, but also a storytelling way in a, in a, in a wrapped up feature film. But see, the thing is, is that that's a part that a lot of viewers and stuff like that, that, I wish they could experience it more because I think they would appreciate movies more if they if you, they only knew how long these things are, are put away and all of a sudden they come back into your life so unexpectedly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a lot of movies from my past and movies that I love sort of, reawoke uh the desire to do this a film i was really inspired by is called the one i love um starring mark duplass and elizabeth moss um it all took place in one location in a house it explored uh what a relationship looks like when it's really put to the test through this high concept sci-fi movie so yeah this movie is like a you know a, a bunch of experiences from my life over the past 36 years all you know, squished into one movie. Dude, I talked to them about that movie. It was, I, I was blown away by how it really affected their, their imaginations and how they carried it forward beyond those cameras. Yes. Yeah. I, I absolutely adore that film. I, I found it, you know, it's a great 
genre blend and that's that's what i i hope i did with this movie is like in that movie you lean into the sci-fi you lean into the romance you lean into the horror moments you, you lean into the comedy there's so much going on what's what's keeping this movie from being labeled a rom-com it doesn't have to be a boy and girl story it can be a girl girl i mean i mean there, there's such a i mean it really does qualify to be in its own category yeah it's really like a it's a it's a sci-fi dramedy about friendship and grief um, so you're gonna laugh, you're gonna cry. There's really funny moments. I mean, that was the that was the great tightrope fact that Alicia Keatsry pulled off in the strip. There's scenes where you're laughing cathartically, you're just laughing at the silliness and the absurdity of the situation, but then you're really locked into the these two characters and the journey that they're going on together. How many of us out here on this side of that screen, though, are, would love to have a moment like this where we could go back and relive those 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 chances that you know and talk to our friends as if you know they're they're still with us? I mean, that it's an eye opener for people. Yeah, I mean, it's always you know you think woulda coulda shoulda what I would have done different in that time, and then also the interesting thing in our film is that this alien who's taken the form of a recently deceased friend has also all of her memories but without the emotional attachment to right. them at the beginning. So when she's, you know, when Jillian's character is talking to the alien, she's unearthing these things um, from her deceased friend's memories without the filter of emotion. So she's learning things were maybe more different in the past than she thought, or these moments that were maybe, you know, special to only her she found out was way special to her friend as well but see that's what i i love that creative side of that where there was no emotion because you sit there it made me a better listener and a better watcher because we, sometimes we get so locked in on sharing the emotion and stuff like that it's like it's like you know talking to your image in the mirror and because the image isn't going to give you the emotion back you have to give the emotion first yeah and you know the alien in this film is sort of a mirror in the sense too uh in in you know sh when she arrives you know we find out that on their planet, uh, they don't have emotions. And that's why they think that they're so much farther evolved than us as humans. You know, uh, if you think about all the, the death and despair and, and war in the world comes from emotion and, you know, religion and all these different things. And uh, she doesn't have any of that. And being here and studying this human, she starts to pick up on these different emotions and she starts to feel and it becomes a quandary for her oh see i love stuff like that 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 right there is radio station conversation at the cooler because i mean that that, that yes. it, we started on the radio all of a sudden listeners are calling in they're going okay let me tell you about my moment mm-hmm mm -hmm. but yeah it's it's we want people to see themselves in this movie yeah. and, and 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 we wanted to make it very universal so whether you're thinking of the loss of a friend uh the loss of a home uh, a divorce, a, a pet, and any sort of loss, you know, you can see yourself in this film. The movie we're talking about is I'm Totally Fine. It's in theaters, and it's also on demand. I'm I'm a theater guy, dude. I've, I've got to experience that big screen. Absolutely. I've, I've been lucky to see it twice in the theater this week um, at our premieres. I'm actually going tomorrow. I'm in New Orleans right now for the writer of the film's wedding, actually. She's getting married today. Oh. It just so happens that the film is being released on her wedding day, I'm talking to you from my hotel room in New Orleans. Um, and tomorrow, though, we are going to see it in downtown New Orleans uh, in a theater together. To be, I, I, I'm, I'm invited to many premieres and things like this be, because of the things I do outside of radio. But, I mean, I love the, when, when you go there to experience a movie and the rest of the world hasn't seen it yet. It's, it's, like, it's like, I know a secret, and, but you don't want to spoil it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I was that, you know, much like you, I love the big screen. And I was that kid growing up. I was, you know, my friends and I would go see a movie and, you know, I love the big blockbusters, but we'd see these independent films and uh, we would love going and telling everyone, oh my God, you got to see this movie. You got to see this movie. Just all that excitement. I also had a radio show in high school and me and my buddy would go on and talk about all the independent <laughs> movies we would see. Did, did you critique them or did you review them? Because there's such a difference in those, in that kind of a thing. We would, we would, uh, we would, we would review them. Yeah. We, we wouldn't get too critical. You know, we were the 6 a.m. Uh, Stevenson High School radio show. We were trying to keep it light. So we were just like, hey, we saw this movie. We really enjoyed it. We think you would like it because of this. Um, if we didn't, if we saw something, we didn't, we didn't really like it. We wouldn't bring it to bring it to the air. <laughs> now, when, when you do a comedy like this, it changes the playing field because now you can't do another one like this one. You, you, you've got to go the next direction. 
yeah, maybe that big action comedy I was supposed to do comes back to life. Mm. You know, um, going into 2020, I had this really big, fun, silly action comedy. Maybe that's the thing. Um, but I, I, I'm really excited to explore all genres. You know, I'm I'm inspired by filmmakers like Spike Jones and and Edgar Wright. And I mean, you know, Starman was a huge inspiration for this. And that, you know, that was John Carpenter, the master of horror. So I'm, I'm excited to explore outside of uh, the sci-fi dramedy. Do you ever get to be the 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 professor or or the or the teacher in the way that you know, you jump onto TikTok to find out who the next generation of superstar producers are going to be? Oh yeah, I mean I've I've found actors uh, and people that I've worked with through the internet a ton. I mean actually in that Blink One Eighty Two spot, that construction worker, I found him on TikTok. <laughs> He's absolutely hysterical. Um, his name's Stanley, and he got he has this character that he plays on TikTok and Instagram where he just talks about uh, he's a guy in his mid-30s like myself, and he's coming out of mosh retirement, um, and he's deciding to go back to moshing. His, his Instagram Stanley WS. Um, but I found him on TikTok, and I just thought he was so funny. So I DM'd him, and he happened to live in North Hollywood. We grabbed a coffee, and I'm just like, you're hysterical. What do you want to do? And I'm like, I, I got to find something to work with you on. And then three months later when I had this, I just thought he'd be really funny uh, in that piece. You're at that wedding. I'm I'm a wedding DJ, so I always have to ask the question: Is what what do you think they selected for their first dance? What did they select for their first dance? This couple, I don't know. I'm trying to think what Alicia would choose. I don't think it would be Beyonce. She she likes like fun big pop. He likes like noisy garage pop punk rock. I don't know. I, I don't know where it's going to land. Yeah, because my, my, my wedding tomorrow night, it's a goth wedding. And, and, and it's a, it, they're so fun to talk to because I everything. I want to go to that wedding. Oh, God. It, everybody's going to be dressed in black. That's that's really cool. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big metalhead. Um, and black metal and death metal, so that sounds that sounds a lot of fun. <laughs> so writing a book, there's got to be one coming out of you somewhere. Mm. Well, I co-wrote a book with my friend Dave Rispoli and a goblin named John Goblicon for the band Necro Goblicon. Um, that's called John Goblicon's Guide to Living Your Best Life. Um, and we helped this goblin, this mythical creature, write this book. Um, that is something you should keep an eye on because there's something coming around that guy. Um, there's a band called Necro Goblicon who I stumbled and saw play in a bar in 2012 for six people in Canoga Park. And I was so inspired by their music that I said, I want to make a music video for you guys. And it was a total passion project. And day two of it coming out, it was on the front page of Reddit and it blew up. Wow. And now that band is a full-time touring band. They actually played their last show last night of the year with Guar. They just toured with oh Guar. God. And and John Goblicon, the character that came from uh, that video, uh, has now been part of my life for 10 years. And so much so that a publishing company reached out and asked if we would like to write his book. Jeez. See, that's that's what I love about creativity. Eventually, all the circles connect and you help each other out uh, along the way. Yeah, I mean, I could trace this movie, I'm totally fine, back to Necrogoblicon because I made that Necrogoblicon video. Diplo saw it and tweeted at me asking if I would do his next video. So I made a major laser video where I cast Blake Anderson from Workaholics. And through that, I met Kyle Newichek who ended up being the producer and mentor of this film. Oh, my God. Brandon, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you, sir. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You bet. And congratulations on I'm Totally Fine in theaters and also on demand. Thank you. Yeah, go check it out. I hope everyone likes it. You bet. Be brilliant today, okay, sir? Yeah, you too. Thank you.